Uh, let me say hello this morning to all of you, but especially to those of you who are uh, joining us in a grad program for the first time. We're very glad you're here. You have a great treat ahead of you. Uh, I don't know how about you feel how you feel about uh, graduate work, but um, I've never been happier than my years as a graduate student, and I spent a lot of them, a uh, four-year seminary program, and then uh, two different PhD programs. That's a lot of time in grad school, and I enjoyed uh, every year of it. Uh, all of those were not stretched out. They were taken, those programs were taken as fast as they could be taken. Uh, and it was full time all the way through, and I enjoyed every one of those programs, and I look back on them with, with great fondness. So if I weren't, if it would make any sense, I'd go back and do another one. Uh, <laughs> I, I certainly uh, profited and grew during those times, and I know you will get the same thing during your program here. You're here uh, during a, a special year. Uh, those of you who are just starting or returning, this is going to be the sesquicentennial 150th year celebration of Wheaton College. That is a milestone in any institution's life and certainly in our life it's a milestone. And we need to appreciate that. I've been addressing this, uh, we'll be addressing it all year long. And it's important that we, right at the beginning of the year, uh, make some uh, decisions about how to, how to plunge in and participate in this sesquicentennial year. You have to practice to say that word, <laughs> sesquicentennial. Uh, it's not automatic that we will enter in. Uh, there is a way we could stand on the sidelines this year. I couldn't, but many of you could stand on the sidelines this year and kind of watch this go by as, as if it's not related to you. What I really want to do is to address this morning a way of uh, helping all of us, uh, all of you, to come and be enthusiastically a participant in this sesquicentennial year. And my question is, uh, how do we do that? How do you do that? Well, one of the ways uh, is to remember just what it is we're celebrating, 150 years. That's a long time in an institution's history. Let me give you just a bit of background as to um, just how long that is, 150 years ago. This is only about 80 years after the founding of our country that Wheaton College was founded in 1860. Only about 80 years after the Revolutionary War. In fact, it was in 1860 that for the first time British royalty set foot on American shores. First time the railroad ever reached Kansas in that year from the east. And it was the first time that the Pony Express went from the middle of the country out to the west coast to San Francisco, 1860. In May of 1860, Abraham Lincoln was nominated as a presidential candidate. And in November of that year, he was elected president. You think of this, the following month, the month of December, South Carolina seceded from the Union, in part because of Lincoln's election. The Civil War had, for all practical purposes, begun, and Lincoln was inaugurated the following, uh, the following March. And one month later, the first shots were fired in Fort Sumter. So here was Abraham Lincoln, who began in April, March, and then uh, the Civil War broke out formally in April. Four years later, it's an amazing four-year period of time, in April 6, 1865, that was when the South finally surrendered. Lee gave up his troops, and the Civil War was over. Five days later, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. He starts one month before the outbreak of the Civil War, and five days after it's declared an end, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. We think President Obama has faced major hills to climb. Think of what Abraham Lincoln went through his entire four-year period of time as President of the United States. This was the time. This was the period. The period of our nation's greatest crisis and greatest peril this was the time when Wheaton College was born, 1860. Antebellum, prior to the Civil War, in its first four years was this experience, along with Abraham Lincoln, of the Civil War. It's hard to imagine what Wheaton was like at that time. Illinois Institute had begun virtually on this site in 1854, actually, six years before. That was a uh, Wesleyan institution. 
and it was doing fairly well until 1857 when there was a national, huge national economic collapse, uh, drastic collapse, and uh, this Illinois Institute was going under by the late 50s, 58, 59, until in 19, 1859, they pretty much had to hand it over to some Congregationalists who recruited this fellow named Jonathan Blanchard, who had been the president of Knox College down in southern uh, Illinois. He was a strong abolitionist. They recruited Jonathan Blanchard in, to come, and in 1860, they renamed this institution uh, Wheaton College, named after a local family that had given both the city and the railroad and the college some land named it after them, and it became 1860. And the college that you and I know today was born under the leadership of Charles, or Jonathan Blanchard. His son Charles uh, came along later. Uh, what was Wheaton like back then? Well, here's something for you. For admission to the freshman class, early Wheaton students were required to pass examinations in geography, English grammar, American history, ancient modern history, natural history, physiology, arithmetic, algebra, rhetoric, and astronomy. It sounds pretty rigorous, uh, admission standards, but Charles Blanchard, the, the founder's son, he became an undergraduate, and when he did, he wrote at a later time of that uh, admissions process. He said, the faculty of the day, mostly men, was present, my father presiding. A few questions were asked each of us in Latin, Greek, algebra, and English. We answered as we might, I think none so poorly as I did, <laughs> but we were admitted to standing in the freshman class. So it wasn't as rigorous as it might sound. There was one 16-week term in the fall and then followed by two other terms, spring and uh, summer terms of 12 weeks each. There's no mention in that first year of a Christmas vacation. Jonathan Blanchard, the founder, didn't believe in celebrating Christmas as a Christian festival. It was modeled after the... Uh, the pagan festivals, and he begged off, so we're canceling Christmas this year. <laughs> uh, daily life at Wheaton College. Uh, study hours, including class periods, were prescribed, carefully monitored. At 6 a.m., the, the bell, uh, tower bell woke the students. They began their day with breakfast at 7, classes at 8, ran until 11.30. Afternoon uh, classes were from 1 to 4. Evening study hours, 7.30 to 9.30. Daily chapel services given to, and I quote, a student from that time. Highly interesting and instructive lectures by the president. <laughs> uh, some students read essays in chapel uh, a couple times a week, uh, typically. The first catalog listed the names and hometowns of the students. There were three juniors five sophomores, 13 freshmen, no graduate students. The college had no graduate program. In fact, the college was connected to the academy, which is now independent going back to the 40s, but it was like a high school. In fact, the largest number of students to start out, 148, 143 out of 208, uh, were uh, connected to that, what is a, a high school. It's now independent and thriving today, but back then it was all part of Wheaton College. After two years of Latin, if we think about the curriculum, uh, two years of Latin and Greek in prep school, students were ready for the demands of translating Cicero and Livy and Horace and Tacitus in, in Latin and Xenophon, Thucydides and the Pauline epistles in Greek during their freshman and sophomore years as undergraduates. Algebra, geometry, trig, analytics, calculus, routinely expected of everyone. The junior year saw mechanics, hydrostatics, I have no idea what that is, Chemistry, mineral, mineralogy, pneumatics, again, I don't know what pneumatics is, optics, electricity, astronomy, geology, uh, physiology, and the option of French or German for a year. The senior year offered psychology, political economy, a study of the U.S. Constitution, and get this, I, again, an interesting way of putting it, the philosophy of the plan of salvation. Interesting to know what that uh, course was like. Evidences of Christianity, which we think of today as apologetics. Elements of biblical criticism, intellectual and moral history. Noticeably absent from the curriculum of that time was art and music and English lit. The library contained a whopping 600 volumes. But how about this? Tuition was $24 a semester. <laughs> Board for women could be had for $1.70 a week. 
For those rooming off campus, it was more like 250. Many of the men lived with faculty in surrounding homes, such as they were. Uh, rooms in the ladies' hall were furnished with a stove, bedstead, mattress, table, chairs, lamp, and a wash, board, wash stand. Board and tuition, fuel, lights, everything, the whole package could be had for about $150 a year to go to Wheaton College. There was, of course, no indoor plumbing. And each room required its own fire for warmth, so fire was a constant hazard. Uh, there were other hazards on campus. Uh, Early on, the college had a strong prohibition against, I quote, throwing water, fire, or filth from the windows. <laughs> college students being what they are, you know, this is, this is great fun. <laughs> Wheaton's first commencement was held on July the 4th, 1860. They met at 8.30 in the morning on campus and went off, led by the county sheriff and enlivened by the Naperville Brass Band. They marched for two miles that direction until they came to the commencement at 10 o'clock a.m. Each of the, every one of the graduates in that early class, that first class, delivered a commencement speech. How would you like to do that? Go to commencement and every single student gives a speech. The following year, there was no commencement because of what had happened with the Civil War. Well, all of this is an interesting background, but what it signals is an, an amazingly inauspicious beginning to this thing called Wheaton College. 1860, this little seedling located out on the, the prairies back then, miles from, from civilization in Chicago, this little seedling struggling for its very existence was planted out here on the prairie. And here we are 150 years later with a strong, sturdy oak tree that has represented the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom all these years and just grown and been strengthened. It is really an amazing story. There are many other institutions from that period of time who've gone by the board. They were Christian at that time. They are no more. Other Christian schools have come along since, but there's virtually none other than Wheaton from that period. Antebellum still here, standing strong for Christ and his kingdom. It's an amazing story. What will it take for you and me to enter into this year and engage that account, that story, this history of 150 years of what God has done for the, in and through this place uh, down through those years? So it seems to me Psalm 145 can help us on that count. We have chosen Psalm 145 and verse 4 as the theme uh, verse, really, for this entire sesquicentennial celebration. And I want to recommend it to you. Psalm 145, verse 4, reads this way. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. We want to spend some time this year thinking about that, this business of commending the work of the Lord to one another, and to do it some, from Psalm 145. If we drop back from this verse and kind of look at the context of the entire psalm, uh, study the psalm as a whole, which uh, is a wonderful psalm to study, we discover something very quickly. Uh, verse 1 begins this way, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy to be praised. His greatness no one can fathom. And then we come to our verse one generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. What you discover when you come to this psalm is a strong exhortation to be praising the Lord, to extolling Him uh, all day, every day. First thing in the morning, last thing at night, all day, forever and ever. Every day I will praise you. In fact, go, go beyond that. I will commend your works to others. You go through this psalm and you discover the instruction of the psalm is that we are to speak of, we are to proclaim, we are to celebrate, sing of his praises. We've already been doing that somewhat here this morning. It's not just that we are to praise him, but we are to sing of him to others. We are to celebrate for this, our generation, the good things that God has done. God delights in the praises of his people. But I want to suggest something to you that just the exhortation to praise him is not sufficient. We need something deeper. We need a, a motivation that cuts deeper than simply the exhortation to do this. Uh, and this psalm really helps us understanding what that motivation is. It raises the question, what, 
what are we to praise him for? Well, the psalmist tells us, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. We are to praise the Lord for his greatness, his unfathomable greatness. Uh, As I think about that, we are to praise the Lord for his unfathomable uh, greatness. Uh, It seems to me even that is not enough. If we think about his greatness, is that enough to send us into this exercise of giving praise and extolling his name uh, to the generation? My own take on it is that it isn't. Uh, Let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, We are to praise the Lord for his unfathomable greatness. If that is all we have, I question whether it really generates much praise, or at least maybe I should just limit it to myself. It doesn't generate a lot of praise in me. That is simply what we have in the, the God of general revelation, his unfathomable greatness. That's, that's what we know about God from general revelation, and it's in fact known by everybody. It's the Romans 1 understanding who God is. Uh, what may be known about God is plain to the generation because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation, the, the world, uh, the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. That's the Romans 1 God. You can look at what exists and see that God exists and that he is very powerful. He has an unfathomable greatness. To create all of this, any God who can do such a thing uh, is uh, unfathomably great. That's a Romans 1 version of God. And the Apostle Paul says everybody knows that. You say, what about the atheist? Well, the atheist is in denial. As Paul goes on to say, there's this suppression of the truth in unrighteousness, preferring the lie rather than the truth. Why? Because you want to worship the creature rather than the creator. Everybody knows, deep down, even those who are not conscious that they know it. They know that there is a God and that God is very powerful. That has been made known to every single human being so that everyone is without excuse. But I want to ask you, is that enough to praise God? I I have to tell you, it really isn't for me. If that's all I knew about God, it would not have that effect for me. Let me show you what I mean. Think with me for a minute about this this God that we're talking about, who created all of this. I'm an amateur, uh, I pay attention, put it that way, to the issues of cosmology and physics. I I'm know enough to be dangerous, but I, I have a real interest in it, and I pay attention to it. Whether we're talking about the, the hugeness of the, the cosmos or all the way down to the tininess of things, uh, it all tells us something about the greatness of God. And catch this. Uh, the observable universe that we exist in contains, as best we can estimate, about 50 billion trillion stars. You take this number, a trillion, and then you multiply that. We can't even get our head around a trillion, and then multiply that by 50 billion trillion. That's the number of stars, approximately, that we are aware of. And the fact of the matter is, uh, we are also able to discern that uh, the universe is far larger than that. What we are able to observe, the observable universe, doesn't even take into consideration what the physicists call dark energy and dark matter. It's only about 1% or 2% of the entire universe that exists is what we can observe, this 50 billion trillion stars. And what's more, uh, this observable universe of ours, all of that amazing expansiveness, light travels 186,000 miles a second, seven times around the earth in one second. Think of light, how far it travels in a year. Multiply that by billions. This is the, these are the distances we're talking about. Our minds just boggle. We can't really... And what's more, the universe that we know is an expanding universe. And in fact, the light that we're seeing from these ancient stars has been traveling for all this time. And the universe has been expanding since uh, that light started traveling. And the result is the the universe today 
from what we can observe is probably 10 times as large as anything we can actually observe. Can you get your head around that? Or you can go the other direction to the infinitesimally small. You know, if you study or know anything about particle physics and you really understand what the uh, physicists are talking about in this so-called standard model, you know, it's absolutely amazing. The world of electrons and protons and neutrons and quarks and pro, pro, uh, photons and neutrinos and muons and this elusive so-called Higgs particle. I, I, infinitesimally small, little, little particles that actually make an atom look large. You go from infinitesimally small to the indescribably vast, and yet the God we're talking about created all of that. What's more, he, he knows every bit of that, every electron, every, every planet, every star. He knows every bit of it exhaustively. The doctrine of, uh, of the uh, omniscience of God says he knows all things actual and possible. There's nothing about that universe he does not, I mean, you say, what kind of a being is this? If all I knew was that, that, uh, that unfathomable greatness, far from prompting praise in me, I'm overwhelmed by it. I, I can't, I just kind of melt into a puddle when I think about all of that. How do you love a God like that? Who is that God? What kind of a being is that? He's so distant, he's so transcendent. He's so uh, other than me. He's so nameless. It's cold. It's off-putting. It's simply the, the nameless God of the deists. And I would uh, experience awe uh, uh, from trying to think about who that God is. I can't quite imagine wanting to praise that God, much less love that God. That's why I say we need more than that. We are called to praise, to extol, to, to sing of his praises. This God whose greatness is unfathomable. In order to really be able to do that, however, we really need the rest of the picture. Not just his unfathomable greatness, but the fact that he is personal. He has a name. He is God with us. He knows us and cares about us, is involved with our lives, this great, infinite God of the universe. If I don't have that, I, it's hard for me to think about how to praise God. But with that, it all comes together. And this, this psalm and this psalmist has both of those. In fact, we have it right there in those verses that we read in those first couple of verses of Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I know who you are. You are my God. I will praise your name forever and ever. What is his name? Great is the Lord. Here you have that famous tetragrammaton, the four, four consonant uh, name of God, so precious that the Jews treat it so rever reverentially that they would not even pronounce it. They would put different vowels with it, call it Adonai, so they would not have to say Yahweh or, or Jehovah. And sometimes they would just refer to it as Hashem, the, the name. This is the private, the personal name of God that he reveals to himself to his people and through them to the rest of the world. This is the God of the rest of this psalm. And if you study the rest of this psalm, what you discover is that personal God, the God who is not nameless, the God who has a name, who is personally involved, personally engaged with his people, working in them and working through them to reach out to the world. This is the God not just of general revelation, but the God of special revelation. This is God with us, Emmanuel. This is God with a heart, God with a face. You know, the, the Israelites were instructed to remember him and praise him and extol him for all his works. And these were not simply the works of creation, the Romans one works, it's all of that and more. It is his works on our behalf, all of that power exercised on our behalf. And that is what the, the people were encouraged to remember. What this psalm reminds us of constantly is what God has done for his people because he loves them, he cares about them. You think of the Passover meal. The whole point of the Passover is to have Israel being remembered, this amazing thing that God did in taking them out of Egypt. You think of our, how much more, if that was true for them, it is for us. 
We live with all of that history as our history too, the Old Testament, but it culminates in the, the incarnation, the person of Christ, God with us, God coming and taking upon himself flesh so that we can see God with a face. We can see his love and care. This one who is tested at all points like as we. This is God coming down and becoming one of us so he can give himself for us. In the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said he was seen me, he has seen the Father. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him. You want to know what God is like, this great infinite God of the universe? Look at Jesus. And you see God with a face. This is this infinite, unfathomable great God who also is a personal God, who lets us see him, see his heart, and understand his care and provision for us. This is the other part of the picture that we have to have if we are going to extol him and praise him and sing of his grace and his power, yes, his power on our behalf expended. And that's what the rest of this psalm does. We don't have time to study it this morning, but just listen. The Lord, his personal name, is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. The Lord upholds those who fall and lifts all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. That is a God that I can praise. That is a God I can honor. As I look back at what he did in the Old Testament, I look at what he did in the incarnation, the coming of Christ. When I look at what he has done in the church down through the, the centuries since then, when I look at what he's done in the life of Wheaton College, when I look at what he's done in my life and hear your testimony of what he's done in your life, this great, unfathomable God, the infinite God of the universe, is a God with a name, God with a face. He's a person. He made us and he's called us to himself. That's the one that we worship, the personal God of the universe. We've got to have that whole picture, the picture the psalmist gives us if we study this psalm in order to really praise him. That's what this year is about at Wheaton College. That's what we're doing this year. Here is David, all these generations, one generation will proclaim this God to the next. And here we are reading David still, proclaiming this God to our generation. And we have the privilege of proclaiming him to our own generation to pass these stories down, these accounts of his greatness and his grace and his mercy, his compassion, his love, his provision, to pass this down from generation to generation. That's what this sesquicentennial celebration is all about. It's not, in the end, a celebration of Wheaton College. That's a means to an end. It's a celebration of what God has done in and through the raising up of this institution, and then empowering it and providing for it and guarding it and protecting it and using it through the generations. We love to hear our fellow believers give testimonies. It would be interesting to have any one of you stand up here and give us your personal testimony of what God has done in and through you just so that we could praise him by hearing your personal story. This year, this sesquicentennial year, is going to be like Wheaton giving its testimony, its institutional testimony of how God raised it up in seemingly so inauspicious, seemingly it just had no reason to thrive except for God's provision, his grace, his protection, and has brought Wheaton to become this amazing institution full of amazing people with this astonishing history that now is part of your history. Now that you're here as a student, this isn't something distant from you. This isn't something that other people did. This is your story. You've now stepped into this flowing river called Wheaton College, and you're now a part of this history. If you realize what this history is, it's a history not just of Wheaton, but of the unfathomable, infinite God caring about and being involved personally and using this place, this institution, to send wave upon wave of his people out into the world to make a difference for Christ and his kingdom. That's what we are celebrating this year. Wheaton College giving its institutional testimony to the greatness, the unfathomable greatness, but also the grace and the mercy and the love of God. 
help us this year as we celebrate this sesquicentennial. Enter fully into it, and I think you will find yourself blessed in seeing what it is that God has done here through Wheaton College over this century and a half. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do give you thanks this morning uh, for your provision. For the fact that you raised up this tiny little insignificant school and you built it into something of substance and strength. Father, would you help us uh, to appreciate that, to look back and remember to celebrate all the good things, your mighty acts on our behalf, your provision, your care, your protection. And Father, as we carry this baton for this leg of the journey, we who are part of this institution right now, would you help us to be faithful to that heritage, a heritage that you have built into this place. We offer ourselves up to you for that, Father. We want to give you praise. We want to sing and extol your name to this generation. And one of the ways we can do that is by telling of your mighty works through a century and a half of Wheaton's history. We give you a praise, Father, for that history, knowing that it is your goodness that has made it possible, your power at work, but on our behalf. And we give you thanks for that grace and mercy and power in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me for a benediction? And now unto him, the one who is able to keep us and to present us faultless before his throne. To him be all the glory and power and dominion forever. Amen and amen. Bless you. You're watching WETN, a service of Wheaton College. For information on our programs, call 630-752-5061 or email wetn at wheaton.edu. A video program guide is available at wetn.org.